Hello and welcome to another episode of our podcast, Reshape Hospitality with Tech. I'm your host, Maria, and I'm joined by my co-host, Kazim. In today's episode, we have a guest who is a seasoned professional in the hospitality industry, known for his expertise and remarkable achievements. His name is Brian Proctor. Thank you, Brian, for being here with us today. My pleasure. I guess when you get to be as old as me, you use the term seasoned instead of old. So thank you. Pleasure. Uh, Brian, you have more than 40 years of experience in the hospitality business and have worked with major global brands. We would really love it if you could tell us a bit about yourself, your journey in your own words. Sure. Well, it all started. Um, I'm originally from Montreal in Canada. I had the opportunity to join my father on a Sunday morning to go into a hotel where he was practicing to give a presentation the next day. And so it was the Queen Elizabeth Hotel, which in Montreal was a very still there. I, th I believe it's a Fairmont now, um, but it was very full of pomp and circumstance and the doormen were dressed as beef eaters and the colors were very rich and they treated my father so well and me so well that uh, apparently as the story goes as my father told it when we got in the car to go home that afternoon after watching him practice apparently i said to my dad hey i'm gonna run one of these places one day and the rest is history and that's really what started me in the in the service industry was that visit with my dad when I was 12. And then from there, um, you know, growing up in Canada, I went to hotel school and my first job was as a night auditor at the Westin in Calgary, Alberta um, and worked around Canada. And then I got a big break in that I was able to come down to the United States to work uh, in Stanford, Connecticut for ITT Sheraton. Um, and that's where I met my wife, married her, and that way I can stay in the country. So that's, you know, I'm I'm no dummy. Um, but at the same time, uh, we got married and then Four Seasons called me. And as a Canadian kid growing up in the hotel business, when Four Seasons calls, you just say, yes, where do you want me? And I'll be there. So I joined Four Seasons in Toronto, and then they were able to transfer me back down to the States to Beverly Hills. Um, and that's real, really where I learned, you know, the true meaning of what luxury service was from uh, the two general managers I was fortunate to work with in Toronto, Klaus Tenter and then Kurt Steelhawk down in Beverly Hills. Um, you know, and then from there, I joined a company called Interstate Hotels um, and worked uh, throughout California with that. And then had the great fortune to join this little company called Starwood Lodging, which at the time was a REIT, um, and they were just starting to get the hotel business set up. So I was able to get in very early and spent the next 18 years um, working with Starwood um, throughout the States. Um, with my biggest joy there is um, I was able to lead what was called the NBT team, which is New Bills and Transitions. Um, for about 10 years working with David Milas, um, who was one of my great mentors. Um, and I was very fortunate to open hotels from the St. Regis in Bora Bora to the W in Austin to the Westin in Aruba and everything in between uh, throughout North America. So exposed to all the brands, all the different segments. And that was a lot of fun. And then I kind of uh, went uh, Starwood was bought by Marriott. I didn't join Marriott. Um, so I did some third party stuff with a small company at the time called Evolution Hospitality, which is now part of the Ambridge family. Um, and then I got to the point where I said, you know what, I got to try something new. Um, mm -hmm. So I found something that was similar but different than the hotel business, which was working as the chief operating officer for a company called Bridge Street Global Hospitality which was a service department um, company that was based in Reston, Virginia, with offices in Singapore and London. So I was able to kind of take the hotel skills and hospitality skills and help in that industry there. 
And then I retired in 2020 and started Leeds Hospitality, um, which is my consulting company now, and started this fun little podcast that I'm sure we'll talk about called Tuesday Thanks. So that's my 40 years in about five minutes. So hopefully that's okay. You're right. Uh, your journey and achievements, uh, Brian, are truly amazing. And I'm sure that our audience will find great motivation to hear about your valuable experiences. Well, thank you. You're too kind. As you said, you are the founder of Leeds Hospitality Group. Can you please tell us about the Leeds Hospitality Group and the services and solution it offers to hotels? Sure. Well, you know, I call it Leeds Hospitality Group, but it's a group of one, right? It's just me. Mm -hmm. And so I've had a lot of fun, you know, dealing with suppliers reaching out to me and saying, hey, you know, we can be your solution for whatever. And it's like, guys, I'm just a consultant. So um, I really started it because my wife said I was too young to retire. So I said, all right, I'll just have this consulting company. And so I've been very fortunate. We started uh, in 2020 and mm -hmm. I've been doing uh, work for, uh, you know, hotel companies like Sage Hospitality Group, helping them mm -hmm. with some transitions. Um, Hay Creek Hotels, I do uh, a lot of, not a lot, I've done a bunch of work for Google um, with mm -hmm. their hospitality team. Uh, we helped open their hotel on their new campus in, in Mountain View, California. They've got a hotel just for Googlers, so we were able to, to help them with that. Um, and then I kind of took it into harnessing recognition and gratitude via uh, via the podcast that I established started up at the same time. So so really, I've got a nice little niche in the hospitality consulting area in new builds and transitions. That's one of the aspects I love. Um, but I've also done, you know, helped companies with asset management, again, doing a bunch of market studies. So just a general help. I don't like to work with a lot of clients because um, that would mean my golf game would get really bad if I was working mm -hmm. too much. So I like to keep my golf game intact. Um, mm -hmm. So just working with, you know, a couple clients at a time, keeping myself busy and out of trouble. Thank you for providing us a brief overview about the Leeds Hospitality Group and how its services and solutions so fulfill the core needs of hotels. Yeah, and, you know, so again, with the niche of transitions mm -hmm. and new builds, it's really helping them develop all the necessary protocols, checklists, and processes to make sure that when you're either taking over a hotel or you're exiting a hotel, that all of the uh, areas are covered and make sure that either you're, you know, starting off well or you're ending off well and giving the new operator um, every information that they need so that they can go right from there. So that's really the the crux of the new builds and transition stuff is just using that history and the expertise of, you know, being a good checklist manager and what needs to be done and when and what they should be looking for in order to take over the hotel and make sure everything's in, in great working order. That's awesome, Brian. Um, as you're hosting an amazing podcast, Tuesday Thanks, where you invite uh, business professionals, right? I would like to know your ideas and motivations for organizing this remarkable podcast. Well, thank you. It's really a passion of mine. And, and it started during the pandemic as simply um, a Tuesday post. So I committed mm -hmm. during the pandemic that I would post every Tuesday a thank you to somebody who helped me along the way in my career, right? Which sounds simple, but you got to do it for 52 weeks and you got to mm -hmm. remember 52 people who made an impact on you. And it's all based upon really um, two things. One, uh, Tiger Woods uh, had his last car accident and one of the young golfers they interviewed that week said, hey, I really want to thank Tiger for doing this. We have to thank him while he's here. He's not dying or anything, but he may never play again. So I'd like to thank him. And so that created a seed in my head. And then when Arnie Sorensen, CEO of Marriott, passed away, um, I watched LinkedIn get flooded and inundated with everybody posting, oh, he had such a big impact on me. And, you know, he was really the reason I got in the hotel business, et cetera, et cetera. 
And I thought to mm-hmm. myself, Arnie's not hearing any of that because unfortunately Arnie's passed. So we really have to thank people while they're around and while they're alive to hear it and hear the appreciation. And so that's when I started the 52 weeks of posting. And so long story short, Mm -hmm. I got to the end of the 52 weeks and I stopped. And then I was getting email after email. Hey, I don't have anything to read on Tuesday. I want to read your funny story. I want to read who you're thanking. And I said, I, I, I don't have anybody else to thank. I've thanked everybody I can think of. Um, and then I was driving home from Florida one time and I started listening to podcasts on the drive home. And I'd never listened to a podcast. And then I said, well, that's kind of interesting. And then when I got home, I had an email from a gentleman uh, who has a great podcast called The Hospitality Mentor, Steve Turk. And he said, hey, would you be a guest on my show? And I said, love to. And so him and I stuck up a friendship. And then I asked him, I said, how do you do this? Because I I don't know how to, as as I've told you offline, I don't know how to spell technology, let alone work it. Um, So I said, how do you do a podcast and stuff? So he told me. And so I just took the concept of the Tuesday Thanks posting and said, all right, now I'm going to have other people come on the show. We'll talk about mm-hmm. their journey through the hospitality or any industry, really. I've had IT people on there and mm-hmm. everything else. Talk about mm-hmm. the journey and let them mm-hmm. thank people who made an impact on their their lives, um, whether it's personal or career-wise. And so I think we're 50, 57 episodes in, and uh, we're now evolving the podcast to be a tool for companies to use um, with their employee recognition and employee uh, retention and appreciation efforts that we can come and do private podcasts internally for your company or public. Um, so I'm evolving it even now into its next generation of what it can do to ensure people are thanking everyone. Brian, the concept behind Tuesday Thanks is truly remarkable and really make me emotional, seriously. <laughs> and I must say, Your podcast provides a valuable platform for business professionals to share the experience with the people. Yeah, it's really uh, struck a chord. I I used there was a CEO I used to work for. His name is Kamal Advani. Um, And after I started the podcast, he he gave me a call and he said, hey, I'm going to use a word to describe what you're doing that I never thought I would use with you and that word in the same sentence. And I said, what that? He said, you're a genius with this podcast. And he said, I've never thought of you as a genius because you're a hockey puck. But he said, people love two things. One, to talk about themselves and two, to thank people. So he said that podcast is genius. So I I knew I had done the right thing when he told me that. (laughs) That's amazing. After working for so many years in the hospitality industry, How much do you think the hospitality industry has changed specifically after COVID-19? And how has technology played its role in this? Well, you know, I think in some markets and some segments, I don't think it's changed too much. You know, if you watch the luxury market um, through the pandemic and out of the pandemic, I find that that seems to be operating as it always has because they were able to charge properly to still provide the service levels that that type of guest had experienced. Where I see the biggest difference is in the three and four star segments here in the States, it's not as exciting to travel anymore, right? Because we're not servicing rooms on a daily basis. We're, you know, we have, now we have mobile check-in, which, you know, the technology there has been a big help there to ensure that that's easier to check in. You can check in online now. You've got your phone. Your phone can act as your room key. So that part of the technology. But what I find that's done is taken away the personal aspect of hospitality. Now, I'm an old guy, as we've established with the 40 plus years and Maria giving me the nice term of seasoned. Um, But I'm an old guy and I still firmly believe that the hospitality business is about people. And the, the importance of technology is to allow the people to do their jobs easier and spend more time one-on-one with the guest and be able to give that service. So I think what the, the, the pandemic did was kind of expedite the use of some of that technology that may not have been perfectly ready, but it's better to be 90% ready than perfect. So, you know, the mobile check-in, the checkout, 
the the use of the QR codes in in room service on the on the TVs and things of that nature, um, and having everything done in a secure nature. I think the technology is no good if it's it's not secure and it's not easy to use. And if I have to go through 43 buttons to do something, then that technology isn't worth it. But if I can do it in three buttons and I know my information is secure, then I think that technology makes things better and allows the service people to service the guest a lot easier. And the other thing too, is this explosion of the soft branding, right? All of these soft brands, you know, at Starwood, we had, you know, you, you know, you've got the autograph collection, you've got the tributes, you've got Canopy by Hilton. All of these soft branding, I think, has really expanded the availability of different types of segments within different markets. So I think after the pandemic, you saw that explode. Uh, Brian, you talked about the human touch. So there are a lot of discussion nowadays that technology is going to take over on every uh, you know, robots are being implemented in the hotels and AI is there. Now people will check in remotely, check out remotely. The human test will be completely eliminated. Well, there are a lot of people who think no matter how much the technology advances, there will always be the human touch with the hospitality industry because that is the essence of hospitality. If there is no human touch, there is no hospitality. So you have made clear where do you lie, but do you think that this technological revolution where everything will be replaced by technology is actually possible? Well, or you know, I fast. think, yeah, no, I, I think, you know, if you look at the different segments of hospitality industry, right? So in the hotel business, all of this remote check-in and everything is kind of new. But if you look at the serviced apartment industry, right? And that was why I wanted to try doing that when I worked with Bridge Street is the majority of our buildings didn't have front desks, didn't have anybody. You would get an email with the key code to the door to get into the lobby of the apartment building. Then you would have a code to get into your apartment. You never met the guest in the service department industry. So is it doable? Absolutely. But again, I think at the heart of hotels, people want that human interaction. AI is great for marketing and creating menus and things of that nature, but they can't serve me lunch. Right. It just cannot cook and it can't serve me lunch. It can create a great menu for us to serve. But at the end of the day, I've got to have a person serve that to me or at least prep a buffet. Now I can check in and check out and never see a guest. That's fine. So that's going to that's going to be fine. But I still need as far as today, a human to clean the room. Right. We can have the robots cleaning the hallways with the robot vacuums, cleaning hallways and banquet rooms and things of that nature. Um, but you're still going to have someone servicing the room. So there's still going to be that human interaction. I think the AI will help with sales and marketing. I think it'll help with menu creation. I think it'll help with a lot of things. But at some point, you do need that human interaction uh, for some things. And also, do you think the guest preferences have changed over the years? Because there is a, you know, a new generation of people who prefer to text instead of call. So even in while traveling, they would rather, you know, pick up their mobile phones and go on the app rather than pick up the phone and calling the front desk. So do you think the guests have does not also want that human touch? They want more technological things. When they check in, the first thing they check is for the internet speed or what streaming service they can access to. And they sort of the classical idea of hospitality doesn't appeal to them anymore. Yeah, I think the obviously, you know, and I, I don't know what the Gen Z, Gen X, millennial, whatever term supposed to be. I'm just an old guy, right? So, so if you think about it, the younger crowds, the younger people, say under 30, who have grown up with having to use their phone for everything, yeah, they just want to text. They don't want to talk to people. They're antisocial. They're, you know, they're full of anxiety if they have to get in a room with more than three people and all of that stuff. They want the Wi-Fi to work, and so they'll. They'll handle all of that stuff, but you have a you have an audience out there of people over 45 or 50 years old who, number one, has more money than they've ever had. Number two, are traveling more than they ever have. They require more personal touches 
Now they can use their phone and text and stuff, but they're the ones who really are buying the luxury market. And that luxury market is still all about service, right? It's still making sure that somebody who is taking your order at the pool for a drink or, you know, getting your ski boots ready at the ski lodge still needs a human interaction. So it's going to always be a constant struggle to say, you know, again, depends on who your client is. If your guest is a young millennial, then yeah, they're just going to want to check in remotely, check out remotely, never talk to anybody and just text everything back and forth. So uh, in that situation, what should an uh, independent and a small boutique hotel do? Because this big brands, they can afford to, you know, throw money at technology. They can try everything that they have, that they, that there's possible for them. But the small brands, should they follow the flagship hotels or should they stick to the basics? Well, you know, that's one of the perks of all the soft branding, right? Because they're independent style hotels, but they're part of the big brand family. So they can piggyback on that. But if you're a small independent boutique hotel operator, you know, I, th the, I think the tech you need and have to have is a good booking platform, right? You have to be able to have people book you very easily and you have to be able to have a good revenue management system to maximize all of the revenue. Now, if I'm checking, the, the typical guest checking into a small boutique hotel is typically somebody who wants that experiential, you know, time. They, they're going to experience something. They're not going to a Sheraton or a Marriott big box hotel in Topeka, Kansas, which is the same as the big box hotel in Boston, Massachusetts, which is the same as the big box Marriott in Istanbul, right? You sometimes you walk, wake up in those hotel rooms and you don't know what city you're in because they're all the same. But so the small independent operator they are doing so well because they're creating experiences and that's what the client their client is telling them they want they want to have the the bike that's right at the front door that i can just jump on and ride along the boardwalk or experience the vineyard with you know a small tour guide something of that nature is it's very important for that independent boutique person that's not for the big sheraton so i think the technology for an independent is Make sure you can book the room, make sure you can maximize the revenue and make sure everything works at Wi-Fi and TV related in your guest room and you're going to be fine. Also, another thing with the alternative accommodation like Airbnb and other uh, platforms is that they offer such a variety of payment methods. You can pay through you know, e-wallets and Apple Pay, Google Pay, all these things. While hospitality is pretty much still limited to credit card payments or so much so as the online payment system. So do you think this is something that the hospitality should adapt? Yeah, I think, you know, I think they're gonna have to go that way just because if they want that millennial type person who wants to use those type of payment systems. Um, but at the end of the day, everybody's got a credit card um, and uh, so I, I don't know if that's a big deal. I haven't heard it being an issue, but I, I do think eventually you're all, all those systems are going to have to be in place at the hotels. That's great, Brian. Because I think the hospitality is sort of at a crossroads where there are two different generation of people with different mindsets, all going for the same industry. And the hospitality needs to either cater to them both or find some middle ground between them. Well, and I think that's why you're seeing so many um, of these soft brands evolving and different brands evolving from the big houses is because they're trying to accommodate all these different segments of the traveling population. And so that's why you've got seemingly endless numbers of brands now within you know, even Hyatt has all these new brands, Hilton, Marriott, all, you know, just you're talking 30 something brands within a company. So that's that's how they're, you know, handling that situation is they're just developing a brand for each type of client that they want to get to. That's amazing. That's a great insight in the hospitality industry. That's why Maria said a seasoned professional who can, you know, talk about a lot of things on the topic. <laughs>
<laughs> we cannot get a millennial or a Gen Z person to talk about these things because you wouldn't know what they're talking about. <laughs> well, that, that's one advantage of being old. <laughs> I always believe that the success in the hospitality industry is depend on the great guest service. But after your discussion, I have concluded that the new technologies have become a necessity for hotels to attract and satisfy guests. Yeah, I think I think again, depending on your brand and and property, you you know the sale of technology or the availability of the technology is so key. I was very fortunate um, the, to have uh, David Goldstone on the Tuesday Thanks. He's the chief sales officer for um, World Cinema. And we were talking about the technology in the guest room through the TV and the ease of use and the security and all of those things. And they're on the forefront of understanding what that client is wanting while they're in the guest room. And we kind of talked about when I opened the St. Regis in San Francisco back mm -hmm. in the early 2000s, probably 2002 or something, we thought we were like really good with technology in the guest room, but the piece was so clunky and so hard to use that it actually made the stay, in my opinion, worse than it needed to be because I'd have the guests would have to call the butler, the butler would have to come and retrain them on that and things of that nature. Whereas now, if you look at the technology that a company like World Cinema uh, has put in the guest rooms, everything is just go, 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 right? And, you know, everybody thought that the guest room would be everything at one point they thought the technology that would take over a guest room was voice activated meaning i could lie in bed and say turn tv on turn lights out boom 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 that's never really come to fruition um and one of the reasons is people are wary about your voice being recorded in doing things and you know now when you're in a hotel room you can use your netflix account well, I'm a little nervous because do I trust that when I check out that it automatically deactivates my Netflix on that system, just like the room key is deactivated when you check out? So, you know, all of these things, I'm a little nervous. I won't do that because I'm old and I just worry about that. But a millennial probably just says, yeah, whatever. It's, it's you know, and does it. Um, thanks for sharing that. Uh... Let's move to our discussion to events. So high tech and HFT are the two of the biggest events. In your opinion, how these events contribute to the growth and development in the hospitality industry with effect to technological advancements? Well, I think like any big event of any kind of conference or company or industry, it's such an important aspect because what happens? you bring the best minds of all these different companies and industries together to answer a problem or to answer a question, to develop a solution to a problem. And I've got to believe, I'm a firm believer that a lot of advancements have come from those types of meetings where, you know, just walking through the high tech and seeing, hey, that's an interesting new technology, what's that? So then you go and you start talking about them. And if they're a good company, they ask you questions. What what problems do I have that they can you know, pro provide a solution for? And then you start working together. Again, I'm not a tech guy at all. And everyone who never has met me will tell you that. But, you know, I'm a good operator and I know what I need to operate. So put that with uh, an inquisitive tech person and that's how things get created. So I think shows like high tech and HFT, I just think that really, you know, gets you to the next generation of what you need. Mobile check-ins, you know, via mm -hmm. your phone didn't mm -hmm. come from just two guys sitting around. That's been talked about for years with the brands and their IT people. And you've got to get all the good sharp minds together. And high tech is a perfect way to do that. So I think a lot of it's networking, a lot of it's just getting together, whether it's over a coffee or over a dinner or just sitting at your booth. I think that's where a lot of these things get generated. These ideas come together. So I'm, I'm a big fan of all of those things. I know some people don't like them. They think they're a waste, 
But I think anytime you can get smart people together to talk about things, it's a good use of time and energy. Thank you for sharing your opinion with us. Uh, I always ask our guests this. Now I'm asking you, what's your advice for young hospitality professionals to help them become a better hospitality professional? Well, I think, you know, and, and this has been a theme on our, our Tuesday Thanks show uh, this season for some reason, but the biggest, not the biggest, but one of the best things I always tell people, I think, is never say no to a challenge or a new role. Now, sometimes you can't move, right? Because of family, you're, you're, you're in one location and because of whatever, you can't move. But if you talk to most successful, high level, I mean, Jeff Bellotti, who's the CEO of Wyndham Hotels was on the show and we talked about this specifically was, if a boss comes to you and says, hey, I think you would be good at this role, and you're thinking, oh, I'm, I don't know anything about it. I'm, if the boss thinks you're good enough to do it, then go do it. Don't say no. Accept the challenge and learn as much as you can because you don't want to just be stuck as a food and beverage employee or you don't want to be stuck as a rooms employee or you don't want to be stuck in the select serve segment. or the, You want to learn it all because at the end of the day, the more feathers in your quill or whatever they call that thing with bow and arrow, where you put it in there, um, the better you're going to be as you continue your career. You need to be exposed to new markets. You need to be exposed to new segments of that market, right? If you're always in select serve, you're never going to learn true luxury service. But if you kind of cross pollinate your journey and say yes to every opportunity and move, I mean, I moved. Now, I wasn't very good at my job, so I had to go where they told me. But, you know, I think we moved, thanks to my wife being very nice, I think we moved about 11 to 13 times um, throughout mm -hmm. our career. Um, so I was working in resorts. I was working in small independent boutiques. I was at a big, you know, 600 room Sheraton. I was, you know, so you're all these little different things added up to your experience so that as you got higher up and were leading teams, you know, so when I got to be um, the area managing director for Starwood for Texas, Missouri, and Kansas, I was overseeing 18 hotels. Now, those 18 hotels ranged from 150 room Sheraton concept to the 1800 room Sheraton Dallas. There were W hotels, there were St. Regis hotels, there was Four Points hotels. All of our brands were in there. The experience that I brought to that job was that I had worked in most of those types. So nothing was overly new to me and where it was new, you just learned. But you have to say yes and you have to be willing to move and take on new challenges. So I always tell people, don't say no, even if you don't think you're ready for it. If somebody thinks you're ready for it, go do it because they're going to mentor you and make you successful. Your advice will be useful for young professionals for starting their professional journey in the hospitality industry. Really appreciate it. Uh, let's talk about your personal interests, like your hobbies, and how do you enjoy your spare time with your family and friends? Well, I uh, again, I am uh, a dumb kid from Canada, so keep that in mind. So I, I, uh, I love hockey. So. I am a big fan of watching hockey. I played hockey till I was 40 something years old. Um, so I spent a lot of time watching hockey, but I'm also a big golfer. Um, so I love to golf and then we travel a lot. Uh, I'm very blessed. I have two beautiful young daughters, one in California and one in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of live in the middle. So we we make sure we, we see them a lot. But and then something I took up later on in life was um, uh racing cars and uh racing go-karts so mm -hmm. um i'm a little too old to be racing cars anymore so um uh, my uh, i have a bunch of guys that uh, we do a lot of go-kart racing across the country so we we do that so in between the golf and the go-kart racing and going to hockey games i try to get a little work done with leeds hospitality 
but not too much because that would take up too much time away from golfing and go-karting. So um, that's kind of what we like to uh, to be doing at this point. And the podcast, because I don't consider the podcast work, right? Mm-hmm. Now, you guys put on a podcast, so you know how much work goes into the prep, yeah. finding guests, all the editing, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I just love the podcast. So I do, you know, again, a weekly podcast as you guys do. And there's a lot of work and time goes into that, but I, I don't consider that work because I just love doing that. So I spend a lot of time doing that. And now I've evolved it into this um, tool that companies can actually purchase and use. Um, so, you know, that's, I, I consider Tuesday Thanks my hobby mm-hmm. type of thing. Wow, that's amazing. And uh, honestly speaking, it's, it's my personal experience. And I believe that for professionals, taking time out to care for us is very important. That help to maintaining in um, health, happiness and productivity. That's really important. No, I, I agree. And I've been fortunate. You know, I had um, one of my mentors in my career was, uh, I mentioned him earlier, his name is Dave Milas. And before well-being and mental health was really, you know, the topics that it is now, you know, and this was year, this again, mid 2000, you know, maybe 2004 or five, somewhere around there, you know, he made it a policy within our team that you were not to do any emails on weekends. Um, he, you know, he said, listen, we, you know, we were at that time, we were flying 160, 180,000 miles a year. We were opening hotels every month, um, just super busy. And he said, listen, Mm -hmm. let's really work hard Monday to Friday, but then Saturday and Sunday, I don't want to hear from you. I don't want to see you doing emails. You need the time to, to reset, recharge and go forward. So I've always, uh, thanked him for being that type of a leader in that he wanted to get the work done, but he also wanted to make sure that we were mentally ready to go every single Monday morning when we jumped on that first flight. He's been a big, I I, I, I truly believe he was responsible for my success at Starwood uh, for so many years because I worked with him for so many years. Um, but earlier on, you know, I think as a lot of people, my father was very influential on me. He was a, he was a banker in, in Canada who did very well for himself. And he was really able to show work ethic and how to treat people. And even though he wasn't in hospitality, he, he pretty much could have been uh, with his mindset. So, and then there's, you know, there's been some general managers along the way that were very influential. The first one being a gentleman by the name of Hugh Harper. He was the general manager at the Sheraton in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, he gave me an opportunity to help open that hotel and then hired me to stay on as the front office manager. And he really gave us the opportunity to work as a team and to build, to gel as a team. We were all very young managers. I mean, we were all 25 years old running this hotel. Um, and he was able to really put a good team together and did some really good work with us there. I still keep in touch with him now. He's retired up in Nova Scotia. Uh, there was a there was a general manager, Fred Corso, who was my GM at the Sheraton in Stanford, Connecticut. You know, he kind of showed, hey, you know, you can have a lot of fun at work and still work hard. You know, you can work hard, but you can have a lot of fun. He was all of maybe five feet tall um, and just a ton of energy, a dynamic Italian guy who just, you know, he he would hug you four times a day. Just, you know, how's it going, all that kind of stuff. And we would have a lot of fun. So he really reinforced the idea of work hard and play hard and have fun and treat people well. Um, and then I mentioned two of the guys from Four Seasons, Klaus Tenter, uh, Kurt Stilhack. They really taught me everything about service. I mean, I thought working for Weston and Sheraton, I knew service. And Four Seasons is at a whole different level, right? And and when you're working at, in Toronto, and you're, which is Izzy Sharp's first hotel I worked at, the Inn on the Park. Um, and then you're working at the Four Seasons at Beverly Hills. And, you, you know, you're serving presidents and kings and royal families and, you know, mega entertainers. You learn very quickly what service is about. So those two general managers did a huge amount for me. And, you know, there's a gentleman, Ted Darnell, who was, he hired me at Interstate Hotels. 
He hired me again at Starwood Hotels, and he went on to, he's now in charge of HEI Hotels. Um, he really taught me that the hotel business was a business, right? Because a lot of times in our industry, a lot of people, especially in the luxury market, doesn't they don't look at it as a true business, right? If, hey, we have to make money, right, to pay the bills. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Ted and his team educated me uh, on, hey, this is a business and this is how to run hotels as a business so that you're not only successful with guest service, you're successful taking care of your employees, you're successful taking care of the guests. And you know what? The owner is going to be happy because you're going to return an investment for them and they're going to be able to sell and move on. So, you know, I think and then one last person, Rick Sewell, who uh, uh, was just a gentle giant of a leader within the Starwood family. Um, mm -hmm. And he was just the sweetest leader I've ever worked with and for. It's hard to say work for because he never you never felt like you were working for him. You were always working with him. So I think mm -hmm. those guys, and then I actually one last one, and then I, I know I'm probably going on long winded, but, um, and then when I transferred over into the service department industry uh, as the COO at Bridge Street, the CEO, Sean Worker, has become a very good friend and mentor uh, of mine. And um, he was very patient with me as I was learning this new part of the business, it's similar but different. And we kicked off uh, a brand, you know, we created a brand called Mode uh, as an apart hotel in Paris and in Edinburgh we opened to. So he was able to um, work very closely with me and, and teach me that side of the business because it is a little different. Um, so I think, you know, he had a big influence. So I think that's enough probably for you, right? This is where we end our conversation. Thank you so much was once again, Brian, for joining our podcast, Reshape Hospitality with Tech, and great to know about your journey and thoughts about the technology and hospitality industry. Well, thank you very much for having me on. I love the show, and uh, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks for watching us. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. We will be back with another guest. Till then, take care and goodbye.